Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based on my background working in a psych hospital. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 32 of the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm Tori Levine, and I'm so glad you are here with me today. Today, you get to hear my conversation with Dr. Lauren Pittard. She is a pediatric occupational therapist and is an incredible source of knowledge, and I just think she is an awesome human being as well. We talk a lot about sensory processing and how all children go through times when they have sensory sensitivities and how all of our senses can contribute to meltdowns and how we can handle them, both handle our child's meltdowns as well as our own that we maybe might not have as outwardly as our kids, but that we might want to have. And it's a great way also to kind of think about our mom's anxiety and calming our mom's anxiety. So this is a long conversation and it is jam-packed full of lots of info. So I don't want to take up much time before getting to the conversation, but a few reminders. Please make sure you subscribe to the Momsiety Club podcast in whatever podcast app you like to listen to things in. When you subscribe to the Momsiety Club email list, you get access to tons of free resources as well as the main resource that everyone loves, Top Ways to Reduce Momsiety. Plus, you'll also get access to special info and you'll get notified if prices are increasing which is happening very soon. So make sure you head to join.momsietyclub.com to sign up. And then when you sign up for the membership, you can lock in at that $15 a month rate for the rest of your membership. One more thing, Lauren and I teamed up a few months ago, and we did something called the Playful Movement Hour. It was incredible. I know after listening to my conversation with her, you are going to want to have more time with Lauren, and you can get that, again, at join.momsietyclub.com. It was live, and we also did a recording so that people can do the replay and get that after the fact. You will get to do an awesome mommy bar style class with your little one to kind of work out uh, some anxiety and get moving with your little one as well as do a great fun sensory activity for your kids that Lauren leads. All right, one more fun, exciting thing. I am so thankful I was recently featured on a Fox affiliate uh, talking about anxiety for parents and for kids during this re-entry period. So if you want some tips on ways to manage anxiety for both you and your child from me, as well as a a children's psychiatrist, head to join.momsietyclub.com or follow along on social media, Momsiety Club, and you can get a link to that story. All right, without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Lauren Pitter of Kittable Therapy. Hello, Lauren. Thank you so much for joining me today and getting ready to share your wisdom all about OT, sensory processing, and the mental health behind meltdowns. Um, Do you want to give a little intro because you are Dr. Lauren now and just then just dive in because there's so much and we could just chat forever. So go ahead. 
Very true. I could chat forever about all of this. Um, but yes, my name is Lauren and I live in Roanoke, which is a small but growing city in Virginia. And um, the overall goal of Kittable is to make things doable for anyone and everyone. And so this is just a little tidbit about how to make meltdowns doable and you know easily manageable for everyone. So like we talked about, we're gonna be chatting about the mental health behind, behind meltdowns. And I feel like I can just hear people like sighing at the word meltdown, right? Like, ugh, they're so exhausting. Because they, yes. are, they are so exhausting. Um, and every kid has meltdowns. And I'm not going to lie as an adult, like even I can have a meltdown every now and then. And oh, yeah, especially uh, moms after you've dealt with the kids meltdowns and then you're dealing with your own mom's anxiety meltdown. And it's like, who's going to take care of me while I want to just roll around on the floor? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, you know, unfortunately, meltdowns are just a part of life. Um, but meltdowns are a major problem and a major disruption in life when these four things happen. So when they last for more than five minutes when they include aggressive behaviors, when they occur daily, or when they just occur like out of the blue. And so anytime your child has a meltdown, whether it's a major one or not, I want to start off by saying that your child is not a bad kid and you are not a bad mom. And so Tori, if you don't mind me asking, how do you feel as a mother when one of your boys has a meltdown? I feel like I'm failing. I, I don't know. I feel a lot of different things. And then I go down the anxiety rabbit hole of something's wrong with them. You know, I did something wrong. I've ruined them. I've caused all these issues. And then I circle back again to something's wrong with them. And then I go to Dr. Google. <laughs> Why? So I'm really super interested in listening about the meltdowns that last longer than five minutes. You know, at what ages and stages do we want to worry on these long meltdowns? You know, there's a million things. I've seen all these things about, you know, strong-willed children, all this different stuff. So, right. Yeah. So it really does vary by age. Um, the five minute kind of Five minute limit is kind of starting around the toddler age. So younger may take a little longer, um, but really it's any of the strategies that I'm, or all of the strategies that I'm sharing later work for any age group. So it should be super helpful. Including like, adults? Including adults. <laughs> including the mom part. I got all the goodness for you. Okay. So, but like you mentioned, um, there is usually some sort of blame involved somewhere, right? Like we feel like there's a blame on us or we feel like there's some sort of blame on the kid. Um, but really with meltdowns, it doesn't mean any person is bad in the situation. It just means that the brain is overloaded and we step out of this rational brain where everything makes sense and go into this fight or flight mode where nothing makes sense. Yes. The brain is just going wild. So after this podcast, I really hope that we can step away from this like bad mentality and start reflecting on the why and what does my child need so that we can remove the blame from us and from them and work on improving their ability to calm in those moments of frustration and overstimulation. So that's my goal here. So you just said we want to figure out the why and what we can do. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. So if you need an example, since you asked about how I feel, I was going to share too, because this we're, this is airing in May, but we're recording this in the beginning of March. So just last weekend, the end of February, I was watching Saturday Night Live. And on the weekend update, there was a character who came on and said, you know, she said, oh, excuse me, I have to sneeze. And then she was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. and they said, what was that? And she said, oh, when I was a kid, I sneezed once and nobody said bless you and a demon got in. So instead of sneezing, she just goes, Instead of like a chew, she goes, oh, blah, 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 blah. so my son last night hit a, my youngest just mm -hmm. turned two, 
hit this super high pitch beyond anything scream and where he's potty training, you know, it depends on if he feels like going or not. And then, so this morning when he woke up, he didn't want to get out of his jammies. Well, it had to happen. And there was the scream and like straight in my face, like looking at me. Let me tell you how mad I am. Yeah. Shrieking. <laughs> And all I could think of is, did somebody forget to say bless you when he sneezed? How? <laughs> I was like, this is like, what is this noise? <laughs> so, you know, we have to have humor. Just making that like sound, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry. That was my total tangent about tantrums. No, I I'm love kidding. it. Yeah. Yeah. Kids will definitely let you know um, when they. When they want you to feel how intense they feel, right? Yes. yes. Um, so before we dive straight into the strategies, I want to go over the senses and sensory processing and how it's involved in anxiety and meltdowns because strategies are like, you know, all fine and dandy, but I believe real results come from understanding the why behind the strategies. So let's break down all this fancy neuroscience stuff and just talk about everyday life. Are you ready? I love neuroscience. Let's go. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so people know about the major five senses, right? So sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. But there's actually three more senses that aren't really talked about, except in the world of occupational therapy. And those are proprioceptive, vestibular, and interoceptive. And those are long, like crazy names, but the concepts are actually fairly simple. So proprioception is about detecting when, where, and how our body is moving. And the vestibular sense is knowing when we are balanced or dizzy or falling. The interoception sense is about detecting signals from our internal organs. So knowing if our heart rate is increasing, if we're hungry, and if we have to use the bathroom, you know, like that internal body awareness. So When we have typical sensory processing skills, our brain takes the information from our eight senses, you know, sends it up to the brain, organizes it, and then sends out a message to our body so that we know how to respond to what's going on in our world and in our body. For example, when we wear clothes, it's touching our skin, right? And so, you know, the touch is going up to the brain and the brain's then telling our body like, hey, it's just clothes, like no worries, keep going on with your day. But if we feel a bug crawling on us, the brain feels that touch and it's like, oh, hey, hey, um, we should respond to this. Like, let's get that bug off, right? We don't want a bug bite. So our brain is telling us how intensely we should respond to all of the information in our environment. But when we have sensory processing disorder, we end up misinterpreting that sensory information somewhere along the way. So with sensory challenges, we end up having exaggerated reactions or maybe some awkward challenges during just normal day-to-day life. So the three types of sensory processing disorder are sensory seeking or sensory craving. And that's when children want more sensory input, which is just a fancy word for information. So input or information. And you may call your sensory seekers like your little monkey because they are climbing on anything and everything, bouncing, climbing, anything they can do to move or anything to get more sensory input, they're doing it. Sensory under-responsivity is where children don't really respond to sensory information. So they're kind of like, la-di-da, like enjoying the world, here we go. And they just kind of ignore the information and may not even notice if they bump into a wall. You know, life is good. <laughs> this is, that was going to be my question. <laughs> you just answered it. I would say, you know, if there's a bug and, you know, it's crawling, but what about the people who don't feel the bug or don't know that they, this is not my children. Well, pop, pop, part of my children, but I'm going to throw my husband under the bus. And this is like, you have peanut butter smeared on your hand for making yourself your sandwich. And now it's going everywhere. Like, how do you not notice that? <laughs> so common. People will be like, my kid has food all over their face. And I'll be like, wipe it. And they're just like, okay. And like, it's still all over, you know, yes. like, we do not know it. And it's just, our brain's not saying, hello, there's food there. Like take care of it. It's just, you know, miscommunication. Interesting. 
Yeah. Okay. So that's two. What's the third one? The third one is sensory over responsivity. And that's the one that we're focusing on today. And this is sensory, um, sensory sensitivities. So that's the commonly used word. And this is when children typically have like the, oh, no response to sensory input and like withdraw from activities. Um, and they're more likely to perceive the sensory input, sensory information as a threat. So these children are more likely to feel anxious. They're more likely to be perfectionist, um, easily bothered, timid. They may lack self-esteem or prefer to have control of a situation because they think if they're in control, there's less to be scared about. And uh, children- Thanks, you just explained to me. Now I'm like, no, wish I knew this when I was a child. <laughs> I'm totally um, a sensory um, or sensory avoider is also another word, but yeah, I have sensory sensitivities where like, I used to cry when my mom would use the vacuum in the house. I could not handle it. And I still like cringe when windshield wipers like go on a car, Ooh, yeah. have, like, that squeak, I'm like, Ugh, but I can still drive a car, you know, like, I can right, still right. Drive, but it's still like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> but sensory or children with sensory sensitivities are more likely to experience anxious feelings throughout the day and have more intense feelings of anxiety and intense responses to that overstimulation, that overloaded feeling. That um, I've heard of this associated with some other things. So this is interesting that it is completely separate um, and it can be on its own, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So one question that I get a lot with sensory processing is about autism and different diagnoses. So it's a common misconception that if you have sensory challenges, that you have autism, Mm -hmm. but that's not the case. Just like if you have sensory challenges, it doesn't mean you have anxiety, right? Right. Um, But children on the autism spectrum are more likely to experience sensory challenges, but you don't need any sort of diagnosis at all. Um, to have sensory challenges. Okay. So can you, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you off a little bit further again. Um, And this is just because the definition has changed and the diagnosis definition has changed since I was working in a hospital with autistic children. Mm -hmm. Now it's not Asperger's autism. There was always actually when I was in college and when I was working in the hospital and all the different stuff, autism was not diagnosed till, uh, at least over two. I don't remember what the exact ages was, but prior to that, they would be diagnosed with SPD sensory processing disorder. So now that's different. So I'm very I don't fascinated, but it's really interesting to hear that this is now sensory processing disorder or sensitivities is being talked about completely separately. Um, and I don't know if that is, you know, the generation right now. I feel, I feel like you're a few years younger than me at least, but I'm turning 31 in two days. Oh my gosh. Happy birthday. Almost. So just, yeah, you're a couple years younger, but I want to say just because that is how it was, it kind of goes the same way with ADD, ADHD. Now it's not ADD. It's just ADHD. Um, I'm sorry. I'm tangent, tangenting like crazy, Yes, but yes, there's that difference. And I don't think unless you are in the field that you realize that that has happened now that there are these changes. So your kid can have sensory issues. And I feel like it was always like this concern. Oh God, I don't want them to be, you know, diagnosed with this because then that means X, Y, Z. So there's all those assumptions and um, correlations and all of those thoughts around every diagnosis really. Right. Uh, Yeah. And that's really changed. So thank you for clearing up that, like the misinformation um, that I think has gotten out there and that is just known via whatever, maybe Dr. Google. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So fun fact, sensory processing disorder isn't in the DSM, you know, that diagnostic Mm -hmm. um, and OTs and other professionals are kind of advocating to get it included, 
but it is considered a symptom on the autism. Right. Autism spectrum. Spectrum, yeah. Kind of where maybe some confusion gets in there, um, but it's also um, really common with other um, diagnoses like ADHD, developmental coordination disorder, fragile X, learning disabilities, and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the diagnoses actually have sensory um, sensory challenges as kind of those like things to look out for for those diagnoses. That is a fun fact. I love that. So here's, um, yeah. So for numbers, numbers wise, 95% of people with autism have sensory challenges, whereas 67% of children without autism have sensory challenges. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty common. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So let's jump back in to the sensory and anxiety piece. Um, maybe like a quick example of what sensory sensitivities and anxiety, when they combine, like what it looks like in normal day life. Does that sound good? That sounds amazing. Okay, cool. So you remember that close example, right? Like our body knows that clothes are on, um, but the brain's not telling us to respond to it because it's just some normal day thing, right? Um, But if you have sensory sensitivities, um, that may not be the case. So think about like an itchy tag on a shirt. If our sense of touch detects that information as a threat, something that we should fear or feel nervous about, we may have a big reaction to that sensory information And it's more difficult to stay calm when we're noticing that tag. So that's something that I hear a lot, you know, like tags on the shirt or the seam Mm -hmm. in the socks and kids are like, can't get comfortable because their brain's saying like, Hey, this is weird. Like this Mm -hmm. is information for me. So they're then heightened in that heightened state. So even if there would be something else that wouldn't normally bother them, it could that instant because they're already, they're already at, you know, what is it? Defcon? <laughs> Whatever. They're in like panic mode, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So anything and everything is just more, um, is scarier for them in those moments. So I have an example for you. Yes. It's not necessarily like an example I've encountered. Um, but it's just kind of a very, I don't know, just to help you get a whole picture of it all. So imagine like the sound of a door shutting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's just a normal everyday sound, but imagine hearing it as the intensity of nails on a chalkboard. That just made me. I know. I know. I, the skin underneath my fingernails are like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. just thinking about it. So if someone with sensory challenges, sensory sensitivities perceive this normal sound as something as painful as I hesitate to even say, but even as painful yes. as nails on a chalkboard it means their sense of sound is processing the information differently and they're more sensitive to that sound than more pe- or most people. So um, imagine expecting that like painful sound frequently throughout the day, right? We open doors all the time. We don't mm-hmm. even notice it because it's just a normal thing. Our brain tells us not to worry about it. But if we do worry about it and it keeps happening, the meltdown reaction is probably pretty similar to what you would have if you kept hearing nails on a chalkboard, yeah. right? Like, wouldn't you want to cover your ears, maybe pull out a scream or cringe or like, how antsy would you feel when you someone was reaching for the doorknob when that happened? It just takes this normal occurrence to a whole new level. Definitely, it's yeah. It's hard for people to understand when they don't experience the same sensations. So you could have this for any of the senses. Yes, any, okay. any of those eight senses. So um, I like to think of it as this way. With anxiety and sensory sensitivities, it's not the reaction that's exaggerated. It's their perception of the threat that's intensified and abnormal. Does that make sense? So it's not the reaction, it's the perception of the threat. Right. So the reaction is totally appropriate for what's going on. If you hear a big boom, you should be scared. Like that's that's natural. But if our brain is sending us the wrong signals, um, then, then we're going to act 
weird act differently. So, I mean, it wouldn't be weird if someone covered their ears for the chalkboard because that's what we expect. But when you detect things differently, it's going to be a different reaction and make you stand out a bit. So jumping ahead, probably what we can do as mom is see what the reaction is, but If we can, if we're able to, even with our own selves, get in our head and say, all right, what was this reaction to? Mm -hmm. And is there a way I can change the perception of that? Right. Yes. So that is, um, so you know that saying probably, you know, this probably really well that you can't pour from an empty cup, right? Mm -hmm. Giving, you can end up feeling burned out. Well, you also can't pour from a cup that's overflowing. So when our kids are overwhelmed, it's like their supersized sense of threat is a big, hefty pour into their sensory cup. And as that keeps happening, their sensory cup is going to overflow and they're going to experience meltdowns. So they have this huge reaction because their sensory cup is overflowing, which can cause a big mess, just like Mm -hmm. clean up really big spill. And this is going to take longer to clean up and it's going to take longer to calm down. So in those moments, they can't give their attention to anything else because their brain is overloaded. And that's why you probably feel that no matter what you do, it doesn't help, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're so overloaded and you want to do anything and everything. And just seems like whatever you're doing isn't right. Um, and that's, you know, again, the blame circle, right? So then, right. It's and then you blame yourself and this whole cycle. So, um, let's talk about three ways to prevent a meltdown and three strategies to use when the meltdowns are actually happening. Sound good? Sounds great. Yes. I was, I was going to ask that as the next <laughs> question. Um, and I guess, where, are you going to give us tips or if not, I'm going to ask for tips on for young kids who don't, who aren't able to verbalize, how do we figure out what those, uh, perception, the threat perceptions are? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I do have those tips for you, Great. but the general answer is that it depends. And I know that's not the answer that everyone <laughs> here because they're like no just give me the answer like okay well let me tell you how to find the answer right so three ways to prevent a meltdown are getting good sleep limiting screen time and finding the cause and effect of the meltdowns so when you get good sleep you know you and the kiddo both um it's so important because sleep is connected to how well we handle our emotions And sensory and anxiety can definitely influence and be influenced by sleep. But that's like a whole nother topic that I could talk about. I was going to say, yeah. Like, what if your kid doesn't (laughs) sleep? That's the... Oh man, I have so many tips for that, but I feel like I would, I would another time. time. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to share like how many hours are expected for each age group. And I kind of bunch these together just for now so that we can keep working on the other strategies. Um, But for under one year, you know, that can range from like 12 hours to 17 hours, depending on how many months Mm -hmm. Um, from kiddos that are like one to five years old, they should be getting 10 to 14 hours, six to 13 year olds should be getting nine to 11 hours. And those older teenagers, um, 17 or 14 to 17 should be getting eight to 10 hours of sleep. And then once we hit adulthood, you know, including you and me and all the mamas out there, we need seven to nine hours. So getting that good sleep and finding the ways to get that good sleep helps prepare to handle those tough emotions that we experience. Got it. But the second one is limiting screen time. And kids should have less than two hours of screen time a day, preferably less than one hour and I know that's super duper hard because we just have technology like at our fingertips all the time, but especially during a pandemic when there's so many things that we're not able to do right now, right? right. Um, so it might help to break up those two hours, like maybe one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. Um, but then the question still is like, how do we spend all those other hours during the day? So 
with those extra hours, it's really great for those kiddos to get some movement in because movement helps with those happy hormones and managing emotions. And kids need about six hours of movement a day. And that doesn't mean like full blown exercise, <laughs> like, you know, um, playing with their toys or walking, going on a walk and, and just somehow moving. Um, you can also play like board games instead of video games. So there's some movement there and it's also some really good family time. And when you start questioning like, oh man, can I really, you know, really take away all of this technology? Um, it's, it's ultimately up to you because everyone's having to adapt right now, right? Mm -hmm. There's no right answer for um, how we respond to a pandemic situation. But um, just start thinking about, you know, the more my child spends time on technology, the more likely it is that they'll have challenges managing their emotions, controlling their impulses and making friends. And so that's been the trend for years and years and years. And that's also like a super common thing that my family's mentioned to me that, you know, their concerns about their kids, like, oh, you know, like it's hard for them to make friends or they get angry so quickly. And so I just let them on their screen. And I was like, well, I know that's like a temporary solution, but but we want to find out what their other interests are so we can expand the things that they can do during the time and um, yeah, find some alternatives to technology. How is that different than going and sitting and reading a book if they're upset and like the distraction of let's calm down? That is a really good question. Um, my guess is probably like screen time and the stress that it can go on the eyes. And then that's you know, visual stimulation, mm -hmm. which I'll talk about in a little bit, but you want to try to reduce anything that you, um, that intensifies your sight. And so maybe it's the actual light from the screen because there are blue lights, right? right. Or, um, like Kindles, they have those light adaptations. So it's like you're reading a book. Mm -hmm. Reading a book is one of the strategies I ask parents about like, oh, do they enjoy reading a book or do they want to draw? Because you know, it's, it's very similar, but I don't have research to support fully, like what the difference is. So okay. I don't do something wrong, but that's what I, that's my guess is that the lighting impact. The lighting. Yeah. And I also know there are so many different versions of screen time. I read a book called the art of screen time, which was very interesting. I'll have to write it down. You yeah. look at it. Yeah. And it talked about the difference of screen time of, you know, watching something, doing something and watching TV, but then also screen time, FaceTiming someone. Oh, well, that's good because it's, you know, socializing you. Right. Happy hormones again. Yeah. So that's an interesting perspective. Um, yeah. Cause I, I'm thinking, you know, there's tons of research about like, um, different kid shows and how quick Mm -hmm. move and how um, that influences our attention and right. bright lights flashing and different things like that. So that's a lot of stimulation versus, you know, face to face too. So yeah, screen time definitely varies. And that's actually um, something to consider for sure. Yeah. And so, I'm sure that's something you work on with families. <laughs> so. For sure. A lot of times I hear like, oh, they'll just suck on their, they're stuck on their video games. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, well, there's tons of board games that are very similar concepts um, for the, for video games. And um, something that I say a lot, whether it's video games or TV shows or any, any sort of toy, that if it's something that's hard to separate from, then it's probably not the best activity for your child to do. So if it's, if separating from whatever it is. So you could say even separating from Legos, maybe you have a set time for Legos and say, this is the time you get. And when that's done, we're removing them and we're doing something else. Yes. Got it. Definitely. So if it's hard to transition, then it's, yeah, not, not the best strategy or not the best activity. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Thank you. That's such a good insight into the different types of screens. So thank you. The third way to prevent meltdowns is finding those cause and effect trends, right? Like we kind of mentioned earlier. 
So when you can take notes on the meltdowns, like in your notebook or on your phone using the ABC method, which is antecedent behavior and consequence. All right. So antecedent is just a fancy word for a cause. So mm -hmm. the cause of the meltdown, why do you think these intense emotions are happening? Was there any sight, smell, sound, taste, touch, or movement that bothered them? Do they feel off balanced or is their body feeling different because of their nerves? You know, are they nervous about something and their tummy's upset? Um, sometimes our kid, sometimes we can tell, <laughs> and sometimes our kids can tell us, um, once they're calm, you know, what caused it, but sometimes our young brains just can't even explain it. So it's totally okay to not know and put a question mark in this like box for antecedent. It's okay to not know the cause because eventually you might figure out a trend, but it's okay to not know. Behavior, or B is for behavior, <laughs> which is where you write about what the meltdown looks like and how long it takes. So is there hitting, crying, screaming, running away, throwing things, pulling out hair, slamming uh, on the floor. And, you know, do, <laughs> we like to say, um, when my niece says this, we call it going boneless where you just like, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So what does that look like? And did it take a minute or two to calm down or was it more like five, 10, 30, even 60 minutes of this behavior? Right. So when you're timing it, is it nonstop or is it, they can't be distracted for a couple minutes and then go back to it? Yeah. It's kind of like, um, well, after a meltdown, you're just going to be frazzled for a little bit afterwards. So I think even noting like, okay, calm down for a bit, but was easily frustrated by. What yeah. Happened. Okay. So just kind of keeping track. Cause that might mean, you know, if you're noticing that they calm down and then get upset like a minute later, or five minutes later, then maybe you shouldn't introduce something challenging during that time. Right. Like maybe we should do something super easy or something they really like during that time until they're ready for an extra challenge. So that's something to take note of. And C is the consequence. And this is where you include what you use to try to calm them and, um, and the consequence of this attempt. So consequence does not mean like punishment. It's just the effect part of cause. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you think, did you give her a snack and did that help her calm down? Did you give him a hug and he just got angrier? Um, you know, just keeping track of what's happening, what's working and what's not working. And keeping track of the ABCs, um, not going to lie, it may be pretty painful at first, you know, just kind of inconvenient. It doesn't have to take like in that moment, right? right. You know? oh, hold on. You're <laughs> flailing over there. Let me just take a little note on what yeah. this was from. Yeah. Screaming or trying to write about what you're screaming about. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, do it later. <laughs> At the end of the day, maybe reflect on it. But you know, if there's a quiet moment, or even when you're sitting there waiting for them to, you know, have that rebound calming time, like just when it's convenient for you. Um, but but noting like the common causes and successful strategies are going to be extremely beneficial in the long run. So again, it's like not really convenient to write all this stuff down, but I consider it short-term stress for long-term success. And it, plus, if you're working with any sort of professional, they're probably going to ask you if you've noticed any trends. And so it'll be really, really helpful to have the best and individualized strategies for you if you can share those trends. Yes. And we need to write things down because as moms, you know, as well as with everything else just in the world going on, yeah, our, brain. our brain bandwidth is like, it goes in, oh, I'm going to remember that. I go, oh, what was I supposed to remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. I live off of to-do lists and sticky notes. That is, that yes. is my life. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing um, I, I really want to give like a little warning about noting all of this stuff is that if the kid's having a meltdown because they don't get what they want and then they get calm by giving them exactly what they want, then it's mm -hmm. 
Probably not a sensory or anxiety-based meltdown. It's most likely a behavioral like, tantrum. Yeah. So that's kind of note too. It's like, oh, okay, well, they're seeing that they get what they want after they scream. So maybe I shouldn't just give them what they want when they scream versus, um, you know, noting like, okay, nothing's working this time. Even if they get what they want, then it's more likely sensory. Does yeah. That- does that make sense? That does make sense because I, I would say that's another misconception, especially around this age, which I know previously we talked um, about that sensory processing issues are common as children grow. So some of it is knowing, you know, I'll just say the terrible twos. Mm-hmm. It's just like the thought is two-year-olds have crazy meltdowns. They tantrum. That's just it. That's because they're two and because they can't say what they want. Well, my kids have been able to tell me what they want for a like they're good. So why are they doing this? So you can know if it's a tantrum or if it's something else. And now I will go back and I'll look at things and I go, Oh, I'm thinking that was a meltdown. That was a sensory meltdown. Yep. Yep. (laughs) And you want to know a little secret? Okay. So, yes. <laughs> the head nod, but yeah. yeah. Um, so sensory meltdowns are more likely when your child is growing, right? When you're having those growth spurts, Ooh. think about it, our body's growing. And so our nervous system, what communicates with their brain about our body is trying to keep up and, you know, so there may be some sort of imbalance there. Mm. So that is something super important to consider. It's um, you know, it's not an excuse, but it might be a reason why this is happening more often. We still want to help them help the kids work through it, even though we know like, oh, well, there's a growth spurt going. We might have some more tantrums here or some meltdowns here, but we don't want to just like brush it off. We want to still be able to build those strategies through it. Oh, I like that. And I just like want to try to put a positive spin on it because normally I associate they're, you know, they're having a meltdown, something bad is going on. They're not getting enough, you know, stimulation from one thing, or they're getting too much, a million different reasons. And now I can go, Oh, well, I've noticed this a lot more recently. So that's a good thing. They're growing. They're learning new skills. (laughs) Here we go. Our brains just growing and thinking and yeah, good thing. Needs needs to catch up. For sure. Yeah. It just needs some time to catch up and that's okay. And as we keep repeating things, you know, it makes it easier. Right, right. Um, Right. So the three ways to prevent the meltdown were getting good sleep, limiting screen time um, to an extent, because I still want to, you know, look into the differences between the screen time. And the third one is tracking the cause and effect, right? So now what to do in the actual moment, like when it's happening, this is the juicy stuff that everyone's yes. like, please tell me. Um, and those are, it sounds simple, but I'm going to tell you how to do them, but staying calm, creating a sensory safe space and confirming their emotions. So these are the big hot three that can apply to any meltdown. Um, so let's start off by talking about what it means to actually stay calm, right? So, um, remember the brain is overloaded during a meltdown and can't handle any additional stress or any more sounds, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have the urge to yell, try whispering instead. And this is my magic tool for keeping my cool. Like there's a moment where I can like feel my body, like being like, oh my gosh, I could just scream right now. And that's mm-hmm. like, okay, now I'm going to whisper. And it really just, it almost like trains myself to stay calm too. But it also sends kids into these moments where like, oh, wait, whoa. Like they, sometimes, you know, they're in behavioral tantrums. They're like, wow, what's happening right now? It almost throws them off enough to where they, they calm down too. Cause they're just kind of, you know, thrown into a loop, but it also creates that calm environment. Right. Cause if we have a yelling competition, that's just going to escalate everything. So whispering. Um, and using as few words as possible. I know tons and tons of sweet moms who just want to say every positive and kind thing that they can possibly say, like anything and everything kind to their child. But again, if their sensory cup is overflowing, they can't even take in the nice things that you're saying to them right now. 
So instead, just wait till your child is calm for a minute or two. Or if you notice there's, you know, like a rebound, Mm -hmm. wait, wait till that's over um, before you start talking things through. Um, Ours is uh, asking questions. mm -hmm. Some some of it will be like, what's wrong? And then we give, we provide too many options. So I know it just adds to the simulation and it's hard to remember. It's much easier for me to remember and say like to my husband, don't ask questions, like, don't do this as I am observing from the outside than it is for me to do it while I'm the one handling it. But oh, for sure. like I said, like this sounds simple, but this it's so hard. Um, another thing that's pretty hard in those moments is trying not to rush to get your child through the meltdown quickly, right? Mm-hmm. This can increase their feelings of anxiety. And like I said, this is super duper hard, especially when you're feeling that mom anxiety. Cause you want to get through that mom anxiety as well. Right. So yes. it may be a good idea to, you know, make sure the environment is safe, your child is safe and just quietly and calmly and in as few words as possible, just let them know they're going to go get them a cup of water so that you can leave the room and have some time to calm down before you go back in to help them. Right. Mm-hmm. Or you can even, if you feel like you need to, you know, keep eyes on them or anything, you can even scoot over to the side and maybe just draw a picture that you can give to the, your kiddo when they're calm, because that's going to keep your mind busy. You're going to be doing something and it'll distract you from trying to say, well, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you feel okay? And it's just going to keep you like busy right. <laughs> and distracted enough so that they can calm and figure out what works for them. So finding those strategies that help you calm so that they can calm too. And to help them calm, the kiddos calm, um, you can softly offer just two things that you think might help them calm. Not tons of options because that's too much information for the overloaded right. brain. Like, do you want this? Do you want this? No, just maybe, um, maybe, you know, with those two options, They'll take one of them, or maybe they'll even say they want something else. And that is totally fine because that's a sign that they're learning about what actually helps them calm. Now, if it's um, a sensory meltdown and not a behavioral tantrum, the calming strategy should not be considered a reward. So for behavioral tantrums, you know, they're crying over not getting what they want. Um, I'll let kids know, like, Hey, I see you upset, but once you feel calm, we can get back to playing this game. Mm -hmm. But for sensory, these options should be tools to actually help them with the calming process. And this, these options, as you keep like, you know, giving these two options, especially if they're working, it helps the kiddo identify what's actually making them feel better. So this helps them be able to reach for it on their own without even giving them options in the future. Interesting. So would that be like, we can turn on or off music to calm down or sit here? Like those could be two options. Yeah. Yeah. Be like, do you want your blanket or do you need a snack or Got it. You go to your room or do you want to listen to some music? Like just two, two options that you can do. <laughs> Not something be like, okay, well, do you want to go to the playground later? Like do yeah. something you can do like in that moment. Cause remember it's to work through, work through the strategy. If they, now, need with, yeah. Oh, sorry. Now with, with you working with children has asking them if they've ever wanted a snack worked. Oh yes. It has because mine, that makes it so much worse for both of oh, them. Yes. And for lots of kids who I've worked with previously. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not hungry. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, either a snack or like one of the water bottles with the silicone straws. Um, water is actually more successful than snacks probably, but snacks still are pretty good. But I like to say when our mouth is calm, our body is calm and our mind is calm. So think about what you do when you feel nervous. Like most people may bite their nails. They may pick at their lips. They'll probably reach for the snack drawer. Mm-hmm. Most of the things that we do when we feel nervous is with our mouth. And so if we can get that mouth busy, like sucking on a straw or maybe chewing on a snack, um, it helps us calm down a little bit faster. That is great to hear. Yes. And that, that does remind me, yeah, my first we would do, let's have a sip of water. Mm-hmm. Hmm, yeah. and 
And it might be, you know, offering those snacks and they're like, no, (laughs) it might be that control piece, right? They're panicking Mm -hmm. on those things where it's like, I can't, I can't even have anything right now because I need to do whatever is in my head and, and everything else is just overwhelming, you know, and and might be one of those things. But yeah, sometimes you can offer things without even saying anything. So maybe they're sitting there screaming and you can just put like a snack bag next to them and a bottle of water and just kind of hang out, like not even offer it to them because they may throw it, not going to lie. Okay. They may throw it or they might like, you know, 10 seconds later when they don't, when they don't think it's you who's choosing it, it's them who's choosing right. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they might go over and, and accept that strategy. Okay. Yeah. And um, is that similar to creating a sensory safe place? Oh my gosh. I was actually saying like, this is actually part of what I was going to talk about for the sensory space. So yeah. Um, I was going to mention a little bit about, you know, eating or having a snack. So, or having a drink too. So good job, Tori, man, you're on it. It's like you, uh, read my notes or something, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, yeah. So, so a sensory safe space is different for everyone. But calming is most likely going to happen when there are fewer things to see and hear and more opportunities for touch and movement. And so that includes, you know, um, that movement of the mouth um, to have something to sip on or snack on to help the mouth calm. Most of the time, um, well, not most of the time, but I guess the most popular sensory spaces that my families have are either like a corner that are like a closet space or even just like a pop-up tent, you know, mm-hmm. and a soft blanket in there, maybe a few fidgets, um, a water bottle, maybe a sensory bin or some yoga cards. And, and this really depends because obviously if they're like angry, you don't want to add things that they can throw. So maybe taking less of that, that touch, that tactile input or the sights, you know, take things away. And it's okay to have like an empty space to just let them chill or, you know, turning on a sound machine so that all the extra noises that might irritate them kind of Mm -hmm. drown out. Like it's, it's okay to just have a a chill space. Right. But whatever you use, make sure that the kid knows that it's not time out, that it's a place to calm down. Um, I think that would be good if you, depending on their age, like you knew what special things were, you could definitely have them help you with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would help then help them learn how to calm themselves. And that's one of the options too, you know, like, <laughs> do you need a snack or do you want to go to your calm corner? Mm-hmm. You know? um, and, and still using as few words as possible. You can even just make the choice for them. Sometimes it depends on, you know, where they are. Emotionally. Oh yeah. Sorry. I was meaning this would, that would take place separately when there was not a meltdown in yeah. process. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that yeah. they would then want to go there even more and know that it was their calm space and things. Yeah. Yes. Sorry for that. Yes, totally. <laughs> um, and, and then when you take them, they're like, Oh, you know, let's go here so we can calm. So they know it's like a positive space. Yeah. Okay. So The third tip on responding to meltdowns is confirming their emotions and giving some validation. So if we tell people how they should feel, it typically makes them feel a little worse instead of helping them overcome or manage what they are actually feeling, right? So Mm -hmm. a common phrase that is almost always said with good intentions is, it's okay. You don't have to be upset right now. Right. And this is definitely more empathetic than statements like just chill or relax. It's no big deal. <laughs> right. Relax. <laughs> so, like, that, that, um, you know, is definitely more empathetic and is totally, totally meant with good intentions, but it doesn't validate the child's emotions. So instead you can confirm with your child that it's okay to feel frustrated by simply saying, I see that you're upset or it looks like you feel scared. Are you scared? And this helps them feel understood, which helps them calm faster. Because if you're trying to prove someone how upset you are, mm-hmm. it's going to keep 
going. It's almost our natural tendency to just be a little defensive, be like, no, for real, like this is crazy. Um, so if we can say like, oh yeah, sounds, sounds like a busy day or crazy day, it will probably be like, yeah, it was. And the conversation's a little easier and a little right. Um, and by confirming their emotions, we're also teaching our kids to recognize what their bodies feel like when they're feeling a certain way and understanding our emotions and how they make our body feel is part of that interoceptive sense that we mentioned in the very beginning. So that, that internal body work and OTs can help with that as well as other professionals, you know, like counselors and social workers, we work on how does our body feel calm? Mm-hmm. So, oh, and I really want to make sure that I mentioned that confirming their emotions doesn't mean that we're agreeing with how they're reacting to their emotions. And yes. Perceptions. It's just saying that we accept them for having different perceptions and that we want to help them manage it, but without saying all that, right? Because we're not supposed to say a lot. <laughs> right, right. Hold down. And once they're calm, that's the time to talk about what they can do next time or what they wanted in that moment so that we can continue to work through feeling overwhelmed. Yes. I love the, it's like one of the, their psychologists who I like their books. And even in the beginning, when you were talking about um, their brain and like processing things, uh, the whole brain child, like upstairs, downstairs brain, and also like connecting and then redirecting. So you can, you connect, you acknowledge, but it doesn't mean that you accept or you, yeah, those types of things. And then you can move on. So. Right. Yeah. It's not like you're saying, oh, you're crying. You must be sad. Like keep crying. It just means like, I I see that you're sad and it's okay. Right. And I, what I try to do is try to remember, like you, like you said, you're teaching them that these feelings are, you know, we, people have feelings. This is what the feeling is that you're having right now. And then we'll, we'll discuss how to handle it later. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so to wrap up all the strategies, the three ways to prevent a meltdown are getting good sleep, spending less time on technology and keeping track of the ABCs antecedent behavior and consequence. And the three strategies to use when a meltdown is actually happening is to stay calm, create a safe space, and confirm their emotions. And there are like a million ways to implement these strategies. Yeah. But I do have an example, just like almost like a mini story of, you know, how to use them when it's actually happening. Okay, great. Earlier, but here's just another way. So imagine your kid is having a meltdown, right? It's almost too real in your head. And so the first thing you do is to stay calm and use your whisper voice while confirming their emotions in as few words as possible. So, oh, you're crying. You must feel sad. Do you need a hug or do you need to go to your sensory corner to feel calm? And maybe they choose a hug So you give them this big bear hug for that proprioceptive input. You might rock back and forth just a little bit for a little bit of vestibular input. And maybe they end up touching your hair or your shirt, kind of like fidgeting with those things. Um, Maybe you even get up to turn off the main lights or close your curtains, grab a cup of water. um, And again, say as little as possible until they're calm for a few minutes. And then you can keep your calm voice, ask if they feel better. And when they say yes, you can, you know, go on with your day and start talking about, you know, what made you feel upset. And if they're old enough, you know, maybe asking what would have made it feel better. So does that feel pretty realistic? It's, it all, does. Like, yeah. It just takes a couple sentences, but again, it's, it's so hard to control our response to almost um, control those moments, right? When really it's, it's a, those are moments of reflection on the why and the what. Yes. And I think some of that is so hard. Like we can think about it. We can try to remember it. And when we're in the middle of our kid having a meltdown, it can be hard because that sets off almost like a meltdown in ourselves with the anxiety. Um, so you want to get it into like your muscle memory. So 
it can be silly, but practice with your, your animal or practice with the, you know, a mom friend or with your spouse. And, you know, <laughs> you could do something silly, like you said, with your husband, like when he gets home or when you get home, like practice that. <laughs> and um, one strategy that I've used with some moms that really have a hard time because they really do like, they have that mom anxiety. They just want to help. And and they just go into that fight or flight mode and they're kind of fighting to conquer this, right? And so it, it's harder to stop themselves and sit back. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes I've had them print out a picture of calming strategies. And so that, when, that way they have that visual cue of like, oh, I'm not supposed to be talking right now. I can show a picture instead. And so that way it's those options are available, right? And it reminds us to just say two things. Um, and that way we're not getting into our habits of talking, talking, talking to so try to work it out. I love that. I'm very big on having visual cues uh, around. So, yeah. Now I do want to mention that um, these strategies will be helpful for like almost any minor or major meltdown unless the child is hungry, sleepy, or sick. So we'll need to meet these basic life needs before we can move on with strategies to work through um, these meltdown moments. That is, that is an important thing to remember. So yes, thank you for mentioning that. (laughs) Yes, because if we're thinking, you know, maybe it's after dinner and you're just like, oh, I'm giving them options. It's not working. It's like, well, maybe he he really did move a lot throughout the day and is feeling super tired. And really like we have to meet that need first and just go to bed early, you know, mm-hmm. like, just need to rest. Um, now. So when, what age would you say is best that you can really start implementing these things? For me, I'm thinking like at least 18 months, two years. Yeah. But. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can use them modify them for all yeah modified for yeah um but that kind of cause and effect thing is probably closer to the 18 month range yeah and I, i'm thinking too like it's always with a newborn even it's good to confirm the emotions and practice that because then you have that muscle memory brain memory going on for you as they age um but it was also very helpful to me in those stages. And I know, um, other moms as well, because we bottle things up because a lot of times moms or if mom is working and spouse is at home, you know, what can you do with a, a blob as some people say, you know, that can't talk, that just cries and sleeps and poops. (laughs) Um, but like talking to them and saying, you know, I can see you're upset and yeah, I'm really upset now too even just saying, but just in that nice, calm manner. For voice for sure. Especially, um, you know, like you said, those itty bitty ones where their sleep is, you know, most of their day. Mm-hmm. And that may be one of those things where, okay, you know, there's crying. Do we need to change diaper? Do we need to go to sleep or do we need to eat kind of thing? Um, but then also finding how can we make the environment calmer? you know, softer voice, softer lights. Um, yeah, that kind of kind of taking it a step further. Like what are those basic life needs Mm -hmm. and what can we do to the environment to make it calm? I I love that. You've given us so many amazing tips and I know I'm more prepared and ready to tackle the next meltdown. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe and hoping it was a little bit better than I did last time hey each each opportunity is you know room to grow so. that's right it's, it's a learning experience <laughs> I mean um the brain you know has this ability to change and so for us and the kiddos too when we practice and we you know keep trying the strategies it makes it easier for us and them um, and that that's also going to help kind of be that point of stepping away from that personal blame and, you know, making a bigger difference and, and those meltdowns and making them go a little faster and less intense, hopefully. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me here today and sharing all your wisdom. 
um, is, I'm thinking, do you want to share anything about what you've done for yourself? I like to ask guests what they've done for themselves. Okay. Um, <laughs> this may seem silly, but I took a shower this morning and, Yay! <laughs> and sat in sunshine. That uh, sunshine is my happy juice. Um, yes. I, I feel like 10 times better if I can just move to a room with a, a window. So today while I was kind of working on stuff, I went to the sunroom and that was a little treat for myself. That yes, I love the sun as well. So good job. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about the realistic self-care. So yeah. I'm yeah. took a shower, you know, woohoo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some happy things. Um, so then also, how can listeners connect with you? Because you are now, um, you're in Virginia and you can work with people there, but you can also work with people everywhere. 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 Yes. So yeah, it would be awesome to keep in touch with any of your listeners out there. My website is kittabletherapy.com. And Kittable is spelled as Kid Able since I embrace kids' abilities. So K I D A B L E, kiddabletherapy.com. And I have a learning hub on there that includes more details on the strategies we talked about today. And from my website, you can also access Kittable Family. And that is a membership site which includes guidance on how to apply the information from the learning hub as well as various play activities that promote development for kids of all abilities using items commonly found in your home. And then to contact me directly with any of your thoughts and questions, my email is lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, at kittabletherapy.com. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Lauren. And um... thank you having me. Yeah. I love talking with you. I think your insight is so amazing and it just Um, we got to talk about a lot of fun things. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren, so much again for joining me and sharing all of your wisdom with me, as well as the Momsiety Club listeners. Remember there is the playful movement hour where Lauren and I teamed up. And so you have Lauren with Kittable Therapy leading the sensory activity and I lead you and your little one in some fun Uh, ways to move together to move out some of that anxiety. Do you know another mom who would benefit from listening to this episode? Please share it with them. You can share on social media or just send it to them in from whatever podcast app you love to listen to. The Momsiety Club membership price is increasing in June. So if you would like to lock in the lower rate of only $15 a month, head to join.momsietyclub.com to sign up. And when you join, you instantly get access to all of the past Momsiety Club Mommy Bar workouts that you can do with or without your little one. You get access to weekly live sessions and those recordings as well as live support and Q&A sessions throughout the month that you get access to. And if you can't make it live, you get the recording and you can ask a question in advance. So just head to join.momsietyclub.com to lock in that membership rate of only $15 a month for as long as you're a member. I can't wait to chat with you further. Reach out to me on social media or respond to an email, hello at momsietyclub.com and Momsiety Club on Instagram and Facebook. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And I cannot wait to see you inside the club so we can help support each other as well as move to manage our anxiety and go from anxious as a mother to cool as a cucumber. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at one 800 273 talk.
The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member 